It is time for another BTS vlog. That's right. Countdown timer is started. Time for the time and date stamp for the vlog. It is one hour and 24 minutes into the day of Tuesday, December 17th, uh, 2013. Wonder why it, this is going to be the vlog for 16th and the 17th of December. Uh, but what's happened is, as I explained before, is that my sleeping schedule is my, my, when I sleep is starting to rotate? It's in flux. It's in change. Uh, and uh, now I'm getting up at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, that means I just got up about 25 minutes ago and starting the day at one one a.m. Yesterday was a kind of a bizarre day because I was supposed to go food shopping. Uh, around 10 a.m. that yesterday, at the end of my day. But it ended up being close to uh, 22 degrees below zero in terms of uh, 22 uh, minus 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, I can't give you what that is in uh, in the Fahrenheit. Let me just sort of see if I can get the uh, uh, a comparison here to let you know what it is now. Uh, give you a difference between uh, Celsius and... Uh, and let's see this here. Let's see, Fahrenheit, it's currently out. Oh, it's actually warmer out. It's actually uh, just about f uh, three, three degrees below zero. That's Fahrenheit, so minus three. Let's see, what's the current temperature now in Celsius? So it's minus three. And, okay, so right now, uh, Celsius is minus 19, uh, and that's uh, minus 3 degrees Fahrenheit, so there's a the difference. So we're now, basically, we're, we're really below zero, and uh, the camera won't survive out there, uh, and the thing is, I wasn't feeling up to it because it was the end of the day, I wasn't feeling up to it to uh, walk, so I ended up getting a ride to uh, the, the food stores. Oh, excuse me. And uh, got stuff like that. So it wasn't uh, the way I was expecting it to be to, to vlog at that time. And then when I got back, I was uh, just ended up going right to bed after I unpacked everything. So what happened yesterday? Not much actually happened yesterday. yesterday. Well, yeah, it just, it just, went, it just went over it. Uh, so I'm just going to leave this opening segment here. It's not going to be much for this opening segment. And then I'll come back later on with uh, some more stuff to talk about. All right. Here we go again. Destroying my sleep pattern. <laughs> You'll find out why when I give you my the, 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 the date stamp for today's vlog. It's uh, 11 hours and 43 minutes into the day of Tuesday, December 17th. That's right. Uh, oh, really starting to screw up my, my, my pattern again. Uh, what ended up happening is that when I get, get on a uh, research tangent, I do need to get to a point where I'm comfortable leaving it and saying, okay, I've done enough work and... And that's what, sort of what pushes the time forward as to when I actually go to bed. And it's not necessarily a good thing. But anyways, that kind of, bring, bring, that kind of brings me on to the topic uh, of my YouTube stroll. Because uh, I do go by, I've been going by pages, uh, not pages, the channels. Uh, uh, and this one girl I've met uh, on YouTube, I've been sort of talking to her on and off. Uh, I like her a lot. Uh, her name is Brittany. She has her channel is, is uh, Brittle Productions. And she's going into the veterinary sciences. I, I, I really see my preferences for uh, videos on YouTube are primarily uh, vlogs and different types of vloggers. Where you know they're in, they're interesting people. I don't need 
I don't need people acting like asses on t uh, act, acting like asses on the video to or, or, or to entertain me. Uh, for me, it's as long as uh, as the person is interesting. It's like going by, meeting somebody, having a nice chat with them, and you know that's what Brittany provides. Brittany provides a nice chat, uh, a nice place to sort of hang out and, and sort of get to know what she's doing in her life. And she's talking about uh, uh, the one thing I found I found funny. Uh, is I found that uh, she was talking about what happens when uh, she is doing a lot of studying for exams and she forgets to eat uh, or, or doesn't eat lunch and it kind of screws up her schedule for the rest of the day in terms of what she's eating and what she's not eating, you know, in terms of, you know, her diet. And I kind of, I understand that because, you know, I'm in a almost continual state of uh, uh, sleep deprivation. And one of the things that happens is that when you're doing work like this, is you do forget to eat when you're studying a lot. When you're studying, unless the food is right next to you, and I do have food right next to me here, but this is like chocolate bars and stuff like that. Um, uh, you do forget to eat, and that kind of once you start forgetting to eat, it's not take it's not an immediate repair to get back into eating again. You take a couple days for. Your system to work out the not eating. There's uh, a whole bunch of problems that goes on in the intestines. There's there's a whole array of problems that sort of pop up when you stop eating or you forget to eat. So it does take uh, if you forget one day to eat, it takes about two three days to really sort of recover from that kind of mess up. And I was sort of thinking about this as I was starting to think about it more and more. Uh, I think about my experience with uh, uh, older a animals and with uh, older people. Uh, where, in many cases, that one of the major problems with older people is that one of the reasons why they get tired is is that older people have a lot of problems with their digestive with their digestive system with their, with their GI system, the the gastrointestinal system, and this causes them a lot of pain. And their first solution, the first response to the uh, discomfort within the GI system is to stop eating. To well, my I feel better when my, my stomach is empty. But the problem that that, that this produces is that if you skip or miss meals, then what ends up happening is it starts a cycle within the body where the body starts uh, reducing the capacity that the body can actually handle in terms of processing food. In other words, uh, your body is used to producing a certain amount of uh, used to is used to producing a certain amount of or not producing processing a certain amount of food, a certain volume of food. If you reduce the volume of food that you produce on a daily basis, your system, the GI system, will adjust accordingly and reduce the capacity used to digest that uh, that that um, that mind, that that process to reduce uh, to process that amount it reduces this it's 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 a capacity to do so uh, and this produces a sort of a, a sort of a I guess it's called a feedback cycle that's what I, I like to because it, it, it feeds on itself. And that's typically known as a feedback cycle. That's, that's where you hear the hum and the sound system like that. It's a feedback cycle where, where uh, noise and signal from 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 the system is feeding back into itself. You get a sort of a, an infinite loop. And what happens with with the uh, the lack of eating with older the people? And this includes old, uh, old older pets. Is they go down a path almost of anorexia or of an eating disorder where they start eating less and less and less and less. And what happens is as they start eating less and less and less, in other words, their capacity to handle food becomes decreased. In other words, it decreases. Um, their energy levels also decrease. And they start feeling tired. They can't figure out why they're, why they're not feeling as buoyant or, or, or you know, where their energy has gone. And a large chunk of the problem has to do with their diet. That, that, that what's happening is that as their capacity is re reducing, instead of trying to force their self, you know, in other words, not really force it, but, but recorrect, recorrect the diet and start increasing the capacity 
that your 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 that your body is produce, processing, they follow the, the decreasing capacity and start decreasing the meals even further. And what happens is, is, is this is what causes a large chunk of the the disorders that we see uh, in elderly people, and and it's one of the big problems is that is is that getting uh, getting elderly people to eat. Uh, it, 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 it really makes a big difference. It's, this is the same thing with animals. Animals, as they get older, will have problems. They'll have digestive problems. They'll have GI problems, and eventually, you'll have as the uh, an animal becomes significantly uh, elderly, there will be a decrease in appetite. There will be a decrease in in uh, energy levels correspondingly, uh, and. Eventually, what follows is uh, what we call the inevitable, or the, to, instead of bring up the term death, as no one really likes to think about it, so we talk about the inevitable, which is, you know. Uh, but this kind of, you know, everything, everything kind of uh, fits in together, and then this is sort of uh, some of the things I think about as I go by these different pages. So, uh, I have one more segment to film. I'm going to do that in a few minutes here, and, uh, yeah, all right. All right, uh, we're back again. This is the next segment. I'm not going, well, I'm not going to give you a, the time and date stamp because this is uh, basically right after the, um, the last segment, uh, I did on Brittle Productions and, and the, the the channel visit going by her channel. And I said, you know, there I said, there are a variety of different personalities on on YouTube, and Brit, uh, Brittany from Brittle Productions is a, one of those personalities. She has a very nice personality, but then, and the thing is, as smart as she is, like she all her grades are top notch. She's a top notch student. She, you know, she's very thoughtful about things and. She's also a very unassuming person. She doesn't assume things in terms of her own uh, sense of. Uh, she's not arrogant with her with with her with her sense of self. But yet, I went by. Uh, and this is what sort of slowed me up today. It sort of sort of uh, set me into a, a little bit of a, uh, a downward spiral spiral in terms of, <laughs> of having a late day, and I've moved this up to. Uh, the second second segment instead of the third segment instead of the third segment because uh, I think there's a lot to talk about here and I'll delay the second segment that I was going to talk about which is the kitchen diner uh, and probably until next vlog when I have more to talk about. Um, but anyways, as I was saying, as I digress, uh, <laughs> tangents are our usual here. Uh, I went by my usual YouTube surfing and take a look at uh, and ended up at the bottom of a page because uh, working on some new graphics for you you'll see there's new graphics on the side here uh, accompanying the video so as I'm talking about something there'll be a graphic uh, sort of next to it and uh, I went down to a bottom of a page work, work, while I was working on a graphic I was getting the graphics for uh, one video that I'm, producing, uh, I'm doing the editing for now that it's on um, the uh, singer Lord, Lord, I think it's Lordy. Sorry about that. Uh, not too sure what her name is. I'll have to go back and check it out. Uh, and so I went down, scrolled down to the bottom, and saw, looked, took a look at the uh, thing that says creators and uh, partners from YouTube. When we, I followed that link and came to a whole thing here that says the next EDU guru. And it's sort of these, uh, these, these, uh, the sort of programs that they help out these YouTubers to become uh, better content creators. But the thing is, is that I went by to the, these channels to see if there's anything significantly different from these channels compared to what I've already seen, and they're not. Yeah, they are. There are more. They, they, they help them. And this is the thing: they help a channel become more popular. But that doesn't necessarily mean the content is significantly better. I'll give you an example here. Uh, one of the channels I ended up going by, and this is where I kind of got tripped up a little bit there because. Uh, 
when you start doing some research, you do have to spend some time in looking at a variety of videos rather than simply looking at one video and making a judgment on the one video. You have to look at a variety of videos. In other words, I make an initial assessment to see if it's worth going back again to sort of, okay, well, yeah, let's mark this guy down. Let's put this guy into the notebook. We're going to go back to his place again and uh, take a look at what he has to say and, you know, on a more in-depth level. And the next EDU is about these, these, these education gurus, and these guys are all fans about science. And this is the next guy comes up, and what he's doing is, uh, uh, the video that pops up, he's uh, kind of trashing uh, uh, Hank Green from, uh, uh, what the, uh, what's, the, what's the second, um, from Nerd, Nerd Fighters. If you, know, if, you know what nerd, if you know what a Nerd Fighter is, you know who John Green is in uh, The Fault in Our Stars? Then Hank Green is his brother, and they're very, they're very popular YouTubers, very popular YouTubers, and they were kind of, they're they're kind of up there in terms of the uh, YouTube royalty, the uh, the uh, cream of the crop, if you will. And this guy is an up and comer. His name is Miles Power, I guess his name is, and he's an up and comer. He's trying to build his channel up, and. He advertises himself as a scientist, but yet when you go and see the science that he's actually supposedly doing, there's no actually no re there's no research there. So he's a scientist, but no research is presented on his on his channel at all. He doesn't do any research on his channel. Uh, <laughs> what he does do is a lot of what they call quote unquote debunking. But the thing is, if you're not re if you're not a researcher. And then I often question this, and this, I, I meet a lot of debunkers, and a lot of these d debunkers, uh, and, and along with the conspiracy theorists, they're not actual researchers. They're not doing the research. So how do you debunk or produce a conspiracy theory if you're not actually doing the research? I mean, this is something that's kind of beyond me, but there are people, I know people who have that attitude that, you know, well, I've got a particular degree, I've got a certain degree of experience in science, I'm going to go out there and show everybody how, how much of a guru I am, and I'm going to go out there and debunk things. Well, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, unless you're a researcher, and if you were a researcher, you'd know this, that... Um, the bunking thing has a massive problem, and I think it's, let's talk about the, the, the very simple science. Let's go into this, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. With any theory, and I've actually tested this out with, the, uh, with my research, doing the random walk, and I can state uh, from experience, from 20 years worth of research experience in quantum physics, that the Heisenberg Uncertainty certainty Principle and the uh, random walk does apply universally. That means that you cannot state with any degree of certainty. You cannot say, sort of say, you cannot state with a specific degree of certainty what something is. You can only state it, it, your belief. You can state to a certain degree of probability, but there's always some unknown. So, in other words, you can't debunk something specifically because you never know exactly what the other person sees or doesn't see. You don't see their opinion because you're not in their eyes. And what happens is that you, if you end up dismissing everything that you disagree with something that they say, uh, then you end up missing out a large chunk of really important information. And the thing is, I've learned this, uh, you know, through experience, through research, is that uh, just because you disagree with somebody and what they say doesn't necessarily mean they're they're uh, they're they're incorrect. In other words, they can be partially incorrect. Some of the stuff, information that they present could be partially wrong, but there could also be very valid information in there that you never considered before. And it's not until you, you really, you know, do this research, and this is hours worth of library research, uh, uh, and I understand this, you just always have to see the research that I do here. This is why I'm bringing the research desk live to you here, uh, behind the scenes like this. It's a uh, it's a complex thing. It's not something that's easy, and I'm gonna have to continue this, this in, in the next segment. Segment. In other words, I'm gonna have to make this two segments because uh, we're running out of time. All right, uh, we're back again. This is we're running out of we're running out of time, so we did the sec the second the third the second segment for this uh, this whole video here. As I was saying, if you dismiss information in a video that you consider to be incorrect, 
you run into, into a very dangerous position where you may be in running. Uh, we, 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 you may be missing, or more likely, will probably miss information that is useful in there, but was never necessarily pre either presented in the right way, or uh, so someone could be presenting information they don't necessarily understand, and so they present it in the wrong way. And they're understanding their perspective could be the, in the wrong way of what they're actually presenting, but the, the information itself could be something that's pretty useful. And I'll give you an a gamble of it is that all you have to do is to understand the, some of these conspiracy theories and how these conspiracy theories work is go into some, uh, some of the history uh, of World War II and how the German scientists uh, like Werner von Braun go into the physics there, go into that take a look at where these scientists came from and how they actually got to the United States you'll find a lot of holes and a lot of problems with the official view of how they got here and that's the, re the reason why a lot of this stuff was top secret. And, and, there's, and there's information that's still classified today. So you're not, you, who are the debunker, are not seeing the entire picture of the thing. You're only seeing part of the picture. So yes, you two have opposing views on a particular thing that you're seeing. But neither of you on both sides have the entire picture of the, of the thing. And this is the same thing that he's going on about, and this is where he's going on about Hank Green. Hank Green winds up on a, um, on a tangent where he's in alignment with the Friends of the Earth. In other words, he's an environmentalist. But the thing is, this isn't surprising. All you have to do is go and look at Hank Green's past, where he comes from. And you will see that, yes, he is an environmentalist. That this, the group that he is aligned with, particularly within Hollywood, are environmentalists themselves. They all support this, this view. And so, yes, his view is very popular, and if you go against his popular view, then you're going to get, you know, what you should expect out of it, because you're, you're attacking a popular view. Uh, because he's, uh, Miles, uh, what is it, what is it, the, 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 Miles Powers, uh, it, it supports, supports genetically modified uh, whatever, right? And I think, as I say, whatever, because it could be food, it could be people, it could be... The number of, of genetic experiments going on out there is uh, wide-ranging. So, there is... It, 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 and the thing is, is that there are... And, and this is where Miles is kind of incorrect, is that Hank Green himself is not necessarily entirely incorrect. What happens is, is that while Hank Green and the friends of the Earth, his friends of the Earth people take things to extremes on the anti-GMO, there are people on the other side of the GMO fence. And the thing is, if you look at the history of GMO, it comes from eugenics. The history of GMO, the history of genetic modification, is eugenics. Who are the eugenicists? They were the Nazis. Where was the, where was if you want to follow the trace back to this whole these whole thing of uh, uh, putting in genetic changes into a particular uh, cell through a variety of techniques that they're describing, you don't have to go too far the, too far back into history. All you have to do is go into Russian Ru Russian uh, um, or I should say uh, Soviet history. Go into the Soviet sciences. Look at the research done by. Uh, uh, the Soviets on virology, and you will find up that that they were doing a genetic engineering using uh, RNA retroviruses, and that this, that this research done by the military, this research that was done by the, by, the, by the you know the Stalin the scientists, they were also being done by the the American scientists. They're also known as the American scientists by. And, and the thing is, and this need, people need to understand a large chunk of the American science is done and paid for by the American military. So yes, there are private corporations doing this and that uh, in the United States, so there is the evil corporation. But a lot of these corporations that are doing this stuff are basically, the research is being funded by the Department of Defense. And, and if you're in this thing, there is no way, in, in this science, there is no way you don't know this. This is one of the reasons why I chose to go down the independent path that had set up my own independent research facilities is because I did not want to be involved in military research. This path was made abundantly clear to me. The, you know, this, these, this, the, 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 military, the military, military path was made abundantly clear to me when I was doing my undergrad work that, that 
the military in physics was omnipresent. They expected that once you finished whatever, you'd, particularly if you're doing anything that had to do with nuclear science at all. In my area, it was basically looking at um, well, the early studies was the looking at um, nuclear reactions in the cores of stars. Uh, <laughs> basically, part particle interactions. Um, but yeah, you know, they're not going to want you walking around the street going, okay, let's see if I can work on a particle experiment, you know, out in, in public. They want the stuff that anything that could be weaponized, they want to keep it within the military. And this is, this is, this is common to all militaries. All societies are like that. If they have that, if you have something that, that could be made as a weapon, then the military is definitely going to show an interest in it. And the thing is, this, this aspect of GMO, genetic modifications and, you know, genetically modifi modified organisms, uh, is completely ignored by Miles. I mean, he doesn't, he, he doesn't acknowledge the negatives. What he does do is he does he, he does use a lot, lot he uses a lot of he uses the word fuck a lot he uses uh, 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 attacks on people and saying that they're unscientific but he doesn't go into the specific details uh, of the research itself and here's one of the problems with, with uh, you know he he scrolls through a lot and shows all these research papers on this uh, on you know showing that that genetic, genetically modified uh, food is safe. Well, I guess you can find as many studies, you know, uh, showing that uh, genetically, modified, genetically, genetically modified food isn't safe. And the thing is, what he has to realize is that everybody, when they're writing these reports, has a vested interest in these reports to show that they're doing something good, that they're, that they're uh, uh, spending their funders' money wisely. And this has been a problem... And I'm going to have to uh, extend this a little bit. Next segment. One more segment. <laughs> last segment. Last point. Well, what happens is that there is an enormous amount of pressure for scientists to... Uh, Compete for funding. All scientists, you know, when you if you're a scientist, you're a researcher, and you're sitting down and you're working on that, that those funding papers, and, and, and working on the research grants, uh, that there is a competition for it, and there are other people, other scientists, other groups vying for a uh, very limited amount of research funds. And so what happens, and this has been pointed out in the journal Science a number of times, that What's been happening lately, as you have more and more scientists out there, as science picks up and becomes more and more expensive, uh, the, amount of, the amount of money that's available hasn't increased as, it, maybe, maybe, many, as many people would argue it should have. I'm not going to argue that it should or shouldn't have because I'm independent. I finance all the research myself through a variety of <laughs> other means. Uh, I do, in other words, I have to go out and earn the money in, or, in order to support the research. Uh, if I don't go out and earn the money, you know, then the research isn't funded, and that's basically it. Um, and the Journal of Science has been pointing out since 1990 that there's been a lot of fudging of research, particularly in the, in the genetic community. I'm not going to say that there's not fudging in other communities, because there is. And, but what happens is the result of fudging is something in physics that we know about. Uh, in physics, when you take a measurement and experiment is your knowledge, you, you grow from your experiment, you grow from a research to the theory. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's, that's the way research works. Uh, although, in many cases, as I showed you before, that's not always the case. People want to use the old method of science and have experiment prove theory. Uh, and there's a con there, there is an argument between both sides. There. There's two sides to science. There's the theorists who lead, and then there's the experimentalists. And there's two groups. These two groups are not necessarily uh, in, in agreement with each other. Matter of fact, more often than not, they're in, in disagreement with each other. And what happens is, you know, that when you take do have an experiment, you're if you're looking at significant digit, significant digits, 
you know that your measurements only are only as good as your least accurate information. In other words, taking the measurement, you have several measurements. You may have five excellent, uh, top-notch, you know, highly precise measurements. But if one measurement is off, that one off measurement, that one error in that measurement, affects everything else down the line. And this is what happens with fudging reports. When you fudge a report, or you're using uh, falsified data, or you're uh, writing your report, your lab report, towards a particular funder, in other words, showing them a favorable lab report so that uh, you will get your funding later on down the road, in other words, you're, you're padding your pocket. Uh, it, acts, it has an impact. That negative report, that false report, reflects negatively on everything else. It casts a shadow over the entire research body. In other words, the entire, you have a library of research that's been done for years. If there is fraudulent data in that library, then that fraudulent data taints everything. And so what happens is, is that while the the, 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 while the opponents of GM can't say GM is bad for you, the, all, the, the proponents for GM also on the same side can't say that it's good for you. We know, that we know this because in many cases, particularly with organic chemistry and the organic chemistry within the human body, it's very slow. It takes years for cancer, to, for cancer to develop. Smokers smoke for years. Some smokers, before they develop cancer, will develop cancer. They'll start smoking at 12, 13 years old and won't develop cancer until they're 40 years old. That's, you know, from, from let's say, from, 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 let's just say, round it off from 10 to 40. That's 30 years. That's a 30 year span before cancer develops. So, and as I said, uh, not, 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 not his uh, best foot forward, I would say, I would say if, 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 if he's a scientist. I would say he's more of a debunker. He's more of a, um, uh, you know, part of that crew that does these conspiracy theories. And he, he says he's not, but uh, the, the, the conspiracy theorists have a yin, there's a yin and a yang. There's one side that's on the conspiracy theorists who scream and yell, Oh, it's a government conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. They're all talking about the Illuminati. Then there's another person on the other side screaming just as much, saying the guy who is the uh, conspiracy theorist is, uh, is a nut and goes off on a tangent and, and starts ranting and raving about how bad that the, <laughs> the person on the, uh, the conspiracy theorist, the, on the conspiracy theory side is. But this guy on, who's arguing this, who's arguing against the conspiracy theorist, is just as bad. His views are beliefs, and not scientific fact. The beliefs. Science is not what you think it is. Science is always about the unknown. It's pushing forward to the unknown. And so it's never about the known. It's never about your greatness and knowledge. It's about searching the unknown. And a lot of these scientists who are doing this genetic research are doing just that. They're going to search into the unknown. They're going to come back to their funders and say, oh, yes, it's, 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 it's socially important. But that's not the real reason why they're doing this. They're doing this, a lot of scientists are doing this because they're testing the limits of their knowledge. They're testing the limits of what they know. They're pushing their boundaries. And this is what a scientist does. This is what a researcher does. They push their boundaries. Even if it costs them sleep. It's noon. It's, quarter, it's, 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 it's um, 12, 14. It's 12 hours and 14 minutes into the day now. And I'm just going to go to bed and, and within, within less than six hours I'm going to be up again. That's just kind of how the way things go. And this is the last segment for the BTS vlogs for... Uh, <laughs> for... Uh, uh, the 16th and 17th. <laughs> we have some fun here. Wow, the few of you who watch. Man, I got, I've only got five. He's got. He's got. This guy has uh, 15,000 people. I've got uh, five people watching me on a regular basis. <laughs> hey, high five, people! How you doing? <laughs> Welcome. 
Welcome to the library. And I am a librarian. I am the professor. And professor of what? Professor of physics. Oh, say, can you see? Speech rules here at Democratic Earth.